Well, let me welcome all of you, especially those of you uh, tuning in via some sort of device TV. Maybe you're in, you're in Iowa or Minnesota or wherever you're at. Uh, I've got folks with me in person, and I know many of us are all over the place, especially at this time of year. Right now, you might be, I don't know, like at a wedding, tr- pretending like you're paying attention and you're looking down. I don't know. But uh, we're in a series right now that is super important. We're looking at what's called the Apostles' Creed. And so I, what I'd like for you to put your mind on is that there is this almost borderline ancient thing that was assembled by Christians so that they would remember su- like super important things, truths that they didn't want to have manipulated by their feelings and emotions and just trends and things like that. So they assembled it and it cost some of them uh, they, their, their literally reputation to be willing to say, yeah, this is true. Well, we're going to talk about that, but I, I want to quickly get into this because this is like the sixth week that we're in this. And I want to show you something that, that Jesus said that will help us with what we're going to do. Uh, now I say to you that you are Peter and upon this rock, I will build my church and all the powers of hell, some versions will say Hades, if you're reading that with me, uh, will not conquer it. What I'd like to highlight uh, is that. Um, my guess is, in fact, let me take a poll. And even if you're not with me, like just everyone, um, who has an opinion about church? Anyone? I do. Okay. Now, I'd like to not hear your opinion right now at all. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but I do want to talk to you about church because Jesus brought church up. So I hope you know that it's not just because, well, we're going to get to the creed and it brings it up, but, but Jesus brought it up. And, and when Jesus brings things up, you and I should say, tell, tell me more. And, and just like I asked you, because you might, might, you might have a mental picture, maybe bullet point list of like, oh, I know what church is. Here's my opinion about church. And you, you can rattle off a lot of thoughts and opinions. Yeah. Uh, but I want to make sure that we understand what Jesus was saying, not what you and I think, okay? I'm not trying to hate on anyone, but I want all of us to know what Jesus was saying, not just our feelings about it. And the word church there is ecclesia. This is the word that Jesus used, and he was using it in front of a, a group of people that when they heard it, they did not hear, oh, a bunch of people who get together and sing certain songs and certain styles, and, and there's going to be a, a preacher person who's going to get up and say stuff, and, and it's a good place for me to feel judged. And, and they, they, that wasn't like rattling around in their minds when Jesus said, Uh, I'm going to start the church. This is the definition that would have been working in their minds. A gathering of citizens called out from their homes into a public place, an assembly. In their minds, the word church was not brand new to them, and they're not going, we've never heard this before. He was changing, and what you need to notice when Jesus brought it up did you notice that he said, my church? He didn't say, uh, so I'm going to build uh, your church. Please assemble all of your thoughts on it. When Jesus talked about the church, he labeled it with a distinctive, it be his, okay? And you and I have got to wrestle with this because when you and I like stuff, or let me, when you and I have opinions about stuff, we begin to make it so personal that it becomes more ours than his. So, all of this because the creed says this. It brings up, after I, you know, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, just, I, yes, yes, I will talk about this. Some of you are like, we're Catholic? <laughs> this is a different kind of Catholic. I understand. The Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. So my personality is, I would like to immediately address the elephant in the room or on your TV or phone or uh, uh, here, the Holy Catholic Church does not equal the Holy Catholic Church. You're welcome. I spent all week on that. Um, what you need to see is there's a major difference that I 
put on here, and, and you need to see lowercase c, welcome to English class, capital C. When I read to you this, that little blip in the Apostles' Creed, you may not remember it now, but the Catholic part was not capitalized when they threw it into the creed. You and I, when I say the word Catholic, you're probably thinking of whatever you want to call it, a, a church, a religion, a denomination, a, a whatever you want to call it. But when you and I say the word Catholic, you and I have a tendency to think about a very distinct actual group of people that have very distinct things that they do and don't do. That's what many of us think. That's not what was put into the creed. And that's why when a guy like me reads that, hey, we're going to talk about being the Holy Catholic Church, some of you are freaking out internally going, this makes no sense. So let me help you make full sense of this if you don't know. The reason they said Catholic was because of the meaning of the word Catholic. Lower case, it's an adjective. Again, English class, no, but this makes sense. It's an adjective. It was used to describe the church universal. When it was put into the creed, they were saying, we believe, I believe, in the universal church that all over the place, there is this unifying piece that, that brings us together. And it's not like, yeah, you do your own thing, your own religion, your own this. They believed that there was Jesus talked about the church, but it was universal, and there's a lot of meaning there. So do not get weirded out and say, oh, I thought the whole Apostles' Creed was a Catholic thing. No, it's a church thing designed for you and I to grab a hold of something that Jesus felt was worth dying for. So I'm going to go back to where I started. Uh, how do you feel about the church? Don't answer out loud because I could get my feelings hurt. Uh, I know you feel something about the church. I, I know you and I are, are so human and we have so many experiences that when I say church, you need to know that everyone listening right now immediately begins to feel something. Good, bad. Uh, maybe there's even stronger words there. Uh, while you're thinking about what you feel about the church, I wanted, one of the majority experiences that I talk with people who have a distinct, I don't like the church. Uh, the best way I can illustrate is this. Have, have you ever, have you ever uh, sat in first class on an airplane? Anyone? Some of you, if you're not, don't feel bad. Like, well, they're going to know. <laughs> uh, when Katie and I got married, uh, went on a honeymoon and I don't know if they knew it. I don't know what was going on, but we got bumped up to first class, first flight. She'd never been on an airplane. And as a romantic person, I'm sitting next to her, and she's like, this is amazing. And my only words that could come to my mind was like, please don't expect this. Um, <laughs> being married to me. Um, but if you've, never, if you've never sat in first class, oh, oh, um, it, if you're over like five feet tall. It's wonderful because it's way different than coach. Like, like if you never sat in first class, when you sit at first class, uh, when you sit down before all of, you know, the peasants uh, have yet to board, right? <laughs> because even though when you get upgraded, you're like, oh, I'm elite now. I have reached this status. Uh, I remember sitting there and, and this, la this lady said, would you guys like something to drink? I'm like, in my mind going, I mean, yeah, later, like when we're in, we're in, when we're in the air. And, and she's like, no, now. And like, well, shoot. Yes, I would. Told her what I wanted to drink. Brought it like in a real glass, like, like fragile. We know what I'm talking about. Like you can, okay. I had never been allowed to use such things on an airplane. And, uh, and then later on got food, like not great food. I'm not going to lie about that. But I mean, it, was, it was warm and <laughs> edible. And there's a fascinating thing that, that because I've, I've got more experiences in what we call coach. And, and where, where you like use like a special shoehorn to get yourself like put into there. And, um, and, and, and it's, I, I, I promise you it's hotter back there and it's just different and smellier and dirtier. And I, and it's where we sit. Uh, and, and, 
And I remember, though, the moment, because I had flown multiple times, and I know what happens typically on a normal flight where there's first class and then everybody else. Uh, you get going, and, and they pull this curtain. You probably have seen the, the curtain. It's the, yeah, you people sit here. Don't mingle with those people. And because and, and those people are, sp- are the special people, and they paid more, and they get elite status, and if you don't pay attention, sometimes it feels like there is this gap between those who sit there and, and you and I. And nowadays, you can fly, and there's first class, and there's like comfort plus, and then there's coach, and then there's like that fourth status that's like, um, you, I know you paid for a ticket, but you might not even get a ticket or fly. <laughs> I don't know how they get away with it, but they do, and I tell you that because I think when I ask you, how do you feel about church? Do you know a lot of times as a pastor, I hear something like what I just told you, where it feels like the church people sit in this section and then a curtain is drawn and there's a major separation between two groups of people where we feel like, if, well, if we don't feel perfect, if we feel like we don't know stuff, if we feel insecure about stuff, that, that we're like, you know, I don't belong to that, they don't belong to, and it just becomes this separation. And then if you spend too much time on social media, uh, some of your feelings are, are proven, <laughs> where Christians can seem like they're jerks. And your experiences with people say, I follow Jesus, and you're like, I don't see it. And one of the first things to go, you may have been there, is like, if your church is full of people like you, I don't want to go to your church. I don't want to be a part of that. And I would, I've said this before, if you've been a part of a church, many have rejected who Jesus is because of what the church wasn't. It grieves me quite a bit, actually. And if, if you allow me to be really open with you, I have my own personal stories with church. We don't have time for them, but, but you want to know, I've been in, an, I, I grew up as a pastor's kid. I have, I've been in the church for a long time, and I have been rejected by church people before. I have been spoken of poorly by church people. I have had horrible, horrible church stories that I actually don't want to tell you because I don't want to skew your view. But on the flip side, I've had amazing stories of Christians go, we love you. I've seen the church work well and be healthy, and I've seen the church be the opposite. My guess is you're like me too. Most of us have uh, the both and stories of church. Then this creed brings up the church, and that's why I know you have feelings about it, opinions about it, and sometimes they fluctuate based on your experiences inside and outside the church. So I want to talk to you about the church. Creed brought it up. More importantly, Jesus did. So... Uh, let's go after this. Let's go back to something Jesus said, and we can learn all about this. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. So therefore, here's the deal. Okay, go and make disciples of how many nations? Of all the nations, okay? So you're seeing Jesus not only previously talk about like, hey, here's the church, the church is important, I'm gonna build the church, but he also says things like this, like I want you to go make disciples like everywhere you possibly can. And if you're new to like disciples, like cult, no, not cult. What he's meaning is what I have taught you, I want you to teach. What I have shown you, I want you to speak of and talk about. Who I am, I want you to teach others and lay it out. And he's like, go do this. And he gives an assignment of exactly where, everywhere. This means the church is global, which you already know, right? The church is global. And that is a beautiful, beautiful thing. It means when you and I talk about the church, did you know that there are churches who do not speak English? You should know this, right? I know it seems logical, but I'm making sure that we all know that there are churches, get this, outside of the United States of America. 
In fact, let's go further. It is my firm belief that when we all go to heaven, all Christians, I don't think there's going to be an American section. <laughs> I could be wrong and correct me when we're in heaven together. Be like, you said there wasn't going to be. I, I don't think there's going to be an American section. And I think this is a beautiful thing about the church. That Jesus didn't just say, and he actually he changed the game because some of them struggled with this. He's like, hey, everybody who's like born and raised here, and he's talking to a group of people like right there, there's going to be more people. And they won't all speak the same language or eat the same foods. They won't, they won't wear all the same clothes and have same, all the same traditions, but they will be unified by me. The church is global. When it's in the creed and it talks about, they believe in the, the universal church. They're not just saying universal in our favorite town and our favorite church and the ones that we like and that we listen to. But sometimes we are tempted that because the church is global, we neglect something. So I'll add to this, the church is global and local. It is both and. I know we live in a society now where you cannot be both and. That's just, nope, not allowed to do that. Uh, you can actually be both and. Global, where Jesus said, take this absolutely everywhere, but what we also have evidence of, but where you are is equally as crucial. And I would say, most specifically, the American church sometimes get so infatuated with, I'm not trying to be mean, but infatuated with the global church that we neglect the very cities that we live in. And so I want to show you why I, I would contend that the Bible speaks of a, of a localness, if that's even a word. Uh, this is in the Bible, and I just want you to see how some of these books of the Bible, as we call them, or letters, are, are opened up. I am writing to God's church. You're like, all the you know. In Corinth, now, nowadays we get offended by this. Like, well, what about the church in Rapid City? You didn't say the church in Rapid City. You said the church in Corinth. You didn't say my name. Are you excluding me? No. This, this letter was written to a local church, put into the Bible, it's helping you and I understand there's a, a local, let me show you more, just in case you're like, you just picked one verse. No, there's a lot of them. All the brothers and sisters here join me in sending this letter to the churches of uh, Galatia. That I, guess what that letter's called, their book? Galatians. So when you read things, these are often specific churches in specific places. And what you need to see is when the creed says uh, that we believe, I believe in the universal church. This, it's not just global. There's this local facet. Now, I know some of you know this because right now you're, in essence, tuning in or attending in person at a local church. But, but some of you aren't. And I'm so happy that if you're tuning in, on TV or digital that you're tuning in. I think it's fantastic. But new, do not neglect the local church. It is valued not just today, but it was valued at the very beginning. So, so what does the local and global united church uh, do with their time? And this is where, again, some of our opinions were like, well, well, we know. We gather, we sing the songs that we like, and we stand up and we sit down. Sometimes we dress up and we don't cuss or do bad stuff, and, and that's, that's church. Uh, I want to take you to the Bible. Uh, here's where Nicholas had us last week. That those who believed in what Peter said, were baptized and added to the church that day. There's a word again. Uh, to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. Now, this disrupts. There's a whole other sermon. Other time, you're like, I don't like large churches. Well, that would have been a problem then. And so you, you, have, you have this epic moment where people decide to follow Jesus. They, they get baptized. It's, and it's, a, it's an incredible moment. But I want to, let's continue. It's, it's what they do. <laughs> all the believers... All the believers devoted themselves, and here's the, like what they begin to when they when they assembled. Remember the word ecclesia, the church. What did they begin to do with their time? And well, well, they 
They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, which, yes, I'm a, I'm a preacher, and, but don't forget the word devoted. Sometimes we're like, no, I just want to have like, my mind stimulated. No, no, they took the content that was extracted from, from the word and from, from God, and, and they would devote themselves to that. And listen, listen, they did not devote themselves to the apostles. Let me just speak up because this is me, right? You should never decide that you've devoted yourself to a preacher person, pastor person. That is not what you are called to do. You are not called to simply champion your favorite dot, dot, dot kind of thing. And I love that what the evidence we see is how they devoted themselves to the, the teaching was the big deal, not the deliverer of the teaching. And the fellowship, if that's like, that's a fellowship. I don't use the word fellowship. Uh, they hung out. <laughs> they talked to each other. They knew each other. They spent time with each other. And to sharing in meals and to prayer. Now, this will mess with some of us because you're like, that doesn't sound near as boring as what I thought church was. Because can we say that oftentimes church becomes exactly what we want and then we lock on to that and we stay locked on to that? And you know what happens is it becomes ours and not his. It becomes tradition and what we've done. And it's no longer about just the teaching of Jesus and what we've learned in scripture. It becomes like, this is what I want and I don't care what others want. I love that the creed brings up the church. Because you and I, I think, at least I do, especially as a guy who helps lead a church, I need to be reminded of what the church is and what the church isn't. Uh, So if they're not getting there to get their preferences satisfied, if they're not there just to to just feel good about themselves, what what were they doing by, by doing specific things? Well, I believe they were applying something Jesus taught, and you know this. Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. He was asked, hey, so the law is kind of complicated. Could you sum it up a little bit? And he's like, I would love to sum it up. I am ad-libbing here and using my own language, but I'm just telling you what Jesus was doing. He was saying, yeah, this should be simplified. In fact, I know exactly how to simplify this. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Cool. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. What I believe the early church was doing was they decided they believe in Jesus, surrendered their lives, got baptized, and then they began to come together not to pursue their passions, but here's what they began to do. Why were they listening to the apostles' teaching and devoting themselves to the teaching? Why were they fellowshipping? Why were they eating meals together? Why were they praying? Because they needed help with loving God and loving people. They knew that Jesus had said that this is the summary of all of the commandments. And what they got was something I find incredibly profound, that not only did they believe in the universal church, the communion of saints. Now, some of you are like, yeah, they had communion together. I know, no, 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 yes, but no. Uh, The communion of saints. Uh, They got something regarding loving God and loving others. They got something that I want to seriously address. To love God and people well, we need to be deeply connected, and they knew it. They knew that you and I could easily say, I believe in Jesus, but I don't need that church thing. Let's step on some toes. So some people, and they say to me, David, I can be a Christian, and not go to church. I don't need the church. Some will often tell me to my face, which is always awkward, uh, I don't like organized religion. Um, And I will typically be like, I hate unorganized things of any sort. But uh, I know what they're saying. So if you've ever thought that, I'm not hating on you. I, I think I've even had moments where I've thought, you know, I could be a Christian. I don't need the church thing. And, and I think that you might have somewhat of an argument if Jesus has said, all you need to do is love God. I still think I could argue that. But, but how do you love others well when they need your help? 
and you refuse to be a part of helping them. Do you understand that's what that means? When you say, I don't like church, I don't like church people because they're imperfect, you're saying that I know you need help knowing who Jesus is, and, uh, but I don't like you, so I'm not going to help you. I'm going to go love God on my own. I, doesn't that sound a bit selfish to you? Yeah. So here, basic statement. I need your help and you need my help. Now, you agree with the first statement. Very, you're like, we know that, David. Uh, uh, I, but I, would tell you, I need your help. I need your help following Jesus and being devoted to Jesus. I need your help. But I would also say that you need my help as well. We need each other. I believe the early Christians, and they're assembling this into a creed saying, this is important. Not only is the church a big deal, but us communing and being together. Communion, common union, unified by Jesus, saying we need each other. We need one another. There's a word used in the New Testament, I believe, I believe 94 times. That's not important other than those of us who are nerds. Uh, I think 100 times in the Bible, 94 in the New Testament, the word one another, uh, um, all lay alone or something. Anyways, uh, this word one another, it, it's not two words in their language. It was one word. But what's fascinating is, is how often it's used. Uh, one another, one another, one another. And, and you might be remembering some of this, but I thought I'd give you some examples. Be at peace with one another. Huh. It's hard to do that by simply ignoring each other. Uh, let us not become conceited, provoking one another. On social media, no, no, never mind, it's on, on one another. Uh, envying one another. Seek to do good to one another and to everyone. One another, 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 one another. What I believe is the Christians got that you and I have got to grapple with is that we need each other. And they threw it into the creed going, not only is the church a big deal, but communing together is a huge deal because we need each other. You need me, I need you. And this makes a powerful group of people who acknowledges such a thing. So, what do you do with something in the creed where it briefly brings up the church? What do you do with it? Well, back to your feelings about church, your opinion. I believe there's a significant tragedy occurring over and over and over again, listen, inside of the church. I, I believe it's actually catastrophic to many people's lives. You, right now, just think of what you think it might be. The great tragedy that many people in churches are experiencing. Some of you might be thinking, well, hypocrisy, David, it's obvious. Hypocrisy or here. I believe that the creed helps us understand something that Jesus taught, loving God and others, how we need each other. I believe one of the most significant tragedies occurring in specifically the American church is that there are people attending without connecting, thinking, I'm cool. Check mark. And then something unfolds in their life, whether it's their choice or choice that happens to them. And they're going, Look what the church didn't do for me, and they weren't connected. One of the most profound things you can learn in life is that you need to be connected to other people, and who you are connected to it matters so much. As a dad, I'm constantly, I guess the word would be evaluating, uh, the friends that my kids have, because I know who you're connected to can actually influence the rest of your entire life. And I know this about you and me, that you and I will walk through ups and downs and we need each other. And I think one of the greatest tragedies that we are going, I'm there, I was there. Why didn't I was there? I don't think just being there is enough. So what do I do? What do you do? Next steps. This is stuff I love. Let's do this. Uh, move from nothing to something. In other words, if you know nobody, Move to knowing somebody. <laughs> like, find somebody and say, Pastor said I gotta ask your name. I don't know what your name is. What's your name? Okay, good. I got this, Simon. Yes, got it done. <laughs> That's fine. 
Move, like if you're like baby steps to connecting in the church is not reliant on other people always approaching you and doing everything for you. That's called constantly mooching. What you need to do is like, I am going to go and actually just say, my name is, and hopefully you'll remember, and then, and then you'll hear back from them. And then you have created maybe not a deep connection, but a connection. Some of you are like, I can't do this. And, and how about this? Well, let me help. I, I'd, like to, I'd like for you to text me. Um, if you need help connecting to people in our church, there you go. You're like, is that really you? Uh, you better believe it. Uh, now, if you text me at weird times, uh, I'm not answering. If you text me weird things, I'm going to block you like an NFL lineman. Like, it's like... <laughs> But if you're like, I don't even know how to make the first step of connecting, David. This church is just too big. Text me. If you really want to fix that, text me. And if you, some of you are like, I still don't believe you, try it. I'm not going to respond right now. But <laughs> If you've already done that, here, move from something to scheduled. Move from just literally like, okay, I'm doing a little bit. I didn't want to, maybe another way to say it, move from random to regular. I mean, some of us, like maybe you served at Easter or Christmas one time or, or even what we call love week one time. You're like, I did that one time. Move from that to more regular or maybe you're in a group one time down, move to regular. And yes, you're saying this is a maturity thing, but then there's even another level. Move, move from this scheduled, this, this regular to sacrificial. In other words, maybe you begin to lead something, facilitate something, organize something, and you begin to find yourself, oh my goodness, I know lots of names. I'm connected to a lot of people. I even have people to call when I move, <laughs> which are the real friends. Review for those of you who are like me who forget stuff here. What does the communion of saints, how do I get there? How do I live out the church that is talked about by Jesus and the early Christians that's in the Bible? Find yourself here and move to the next level. It's basic, yet profound. You have a next step. Do not let yourself become disconnected because that is your own choice. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I sure hope I talked about your church the way you wanted to. God, may we be a group of people that aren't about preferences and styles and methods and all that kind of stuff. Um, God, help us to be a church that just loves you well and loves others well. Help us to care for each other. Help us to worship you with passion and honesty and zeal. And, and God, just help us to be the church that you originally wanted and that you know can bring hope to the rest of the world. In the name of Jesus, I pray this. Amen.